there's an old joke running. I mean, I've been working in mobile for probably 15 years now. I mean, related to mobile industry. And you would go to every single event, and you would have some keynote speaker coming saying, this is the year of mobile. And I'm talking about, you know, 98, 99, 2000, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now, the, the other question is, and you start hearing that, this is the year for entrepreneurs. So basically, the question we're asking ourselves is, is it a good time to start a company, to start a startup, maybe to work with Jeremiah? Uh, and to ask, to actually answer these questions, I'm inviting on stage two people, again, the one you know already, you've seen him before, old Malik, uh, but Tony Conrad, who is going to talk to you about, is it a good time to talk, uh, uh, to create a, a startup? Tony Conrad and old Malik, thank you. Hey, Tony. Thanks. Good luck. Okay, Hello. Man. I think I've seen you before. Boom. Whew. Let's get Hello, closer, Tony. Yeah. It's like getting closer would be a problem. So a little disclosure. Tony and I are old friends, and we are also partners at the same VC fund, True Ventures. So that disclosure out of the way, I wanted to make sure that I get to really put you under the microscope today because <laughs> I officially get to give you a hard time in public, right? We were just backstage with Elisa getting uh, our makeup on, and um, I have to say, yeah. I feel naughty. Yeah. I feel a little naughty with yeah. you. For a 60-year-old guy, you look pretty good, man. <laughs> it's like I'm just sad. You know, it's like, for me, I have to do the makeup because I, haven't, I have jet lag and everything. So apparently, you're going to talk about uh, about.me, startups, creating startups, where do you want to start? <laughs> you go, man. All right, so let's talk about about.me. You, you started it, and then you sold it to AOL, and then you bought it back. What's the story? <laughs> Are you tempting fate? You haven't told, I think every time you start a company, you're tempting fate. But um, I think, you know, after, I think most of everybody in the room probably knows the story. We sold about.me four days after we had launched uh, to AOL. So we sold it incredibly young. And I think at that time, AOL had just gone public, and um, uh, I think they were experimenting. They were looking for lots of different areas of growth. And during our time there, I realized that there weren't that many uh, integration opportunities with Mail and AIM and other things that we thought might be there. And I think the company's focus, um, although I shouldn't speak for their focus, I think their focus changed a little bit towards more media-centric things. And so I approached Tim, and we had a very amicable conversation over the course of a year. And we got to a point where, you know, he, he did the right thing, he did a great thing, and he allowed me to buy it back. So how is the company doing now? The company's doing great. So um, when we bought it back in January, um, and you have to remember, when we sold it, it was so early, we hadn't really, you know, it was like the first stage of what we were trying to do. And when we bought it back, we were doing 4 million profile views, and this past month, we did 146 million uh, profile views, so that's eight months later. And the, the key thing for us was to take a step back from trying to grow the number of users that we had, which is a hard thing as a founder, and it's a hard thing as, a, as an entrepreneur and as a board member, as an investor, it's incredibly hard to lay off growth, even though when you know you can effectively acquire customers. We decided not to do that and focus on engagement instead, and the growth in our engagement, and that four to 146 million number is really important to us. Having said that, we've grown tremendously. Um, we're over 200x where we were, uh, in January, and you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced, and more convinced than probably ever that About.me is one of those magical companies that can become a top 10 internet consumer uh, company. I think it's going to be a big play. Well, why do you think that is the case? Is it because you believe that online identity is going to be a huge? Uh, opportunity? Like. Yeah, I think online identity is already huge. I think if we take, a st in 2010, when we started thinking about the idea, Tim Young and, and uh, Ryan Freitas and myself, who were the three founders, I think what we felt like was identity was getting fractionalized and that you have a certain identity in Twitter, you have another identity around your professional graph in LinkedIn, you've got your social graph around around Facebook, you've got your blog on WordPress or whatever it might be. And all of these things you come across in different ways. 
I like to say I'm not the sum of my tweets. As you know, I say some stupid stuff on Twitter, and sometimes I do a little drunk tweeting every once in a while. Um, and I don't want that to become how people view me and what my identity is, right? It's a piece of me, and it's an important piece, but it's not the full piece. So I think that um, our opportunity is to create a starting point for everybody so you can project how you see yourself. And that's actually the most important piece. It shouldn't be left to algorithms in Google. It shouldn't be less, left to you to define yourself limited by your professional experiences or accomplishments. It doesn't tell you that maybe I have a tattoo and I skateboard and I surf and I do other things, right? These are all things that are super important to me and they make up my DNA. So about.me is a very simple concept, very simple page that allows you to put forth how you see yourself. Right. So you said you want to be the top 10 internet properties, easier said than done, right? <laughs> it's always easy, easy right. to say. Yeah. I mean, these days to be in the top 10, you have to look at about 100 to 200 million people using your service yeah. at the very least. Uh, you know, even Twitter is struggling to be in that list in a way. How do you plan to get there? Yeah, I think it's, it's um, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a bit of an audacious statement to make, but I think you look at your product and you ask yourself, is there core market product fit there? Is it something that applies to a niche segment or is it something that applies to a mass um, scale audience? And, and I think it's pretty crystal clear in our case, just looking at our early users, while we had strong early adoption from people like you and people in this room that are part of the tech scene, what's the most exciting is when I start to see 19 year old you know, uh, college kids um, using it um, as a page, you know, to like a resume, if you want, as a way of getting internships or, you know, a, a young college grad. We see um, retirees using it as a way of introducing themselves to their church group to become volunteers, right? So the use cases are incredibly broad, and I think that's the secret ingredient that you have to have if you really believe that you can become a scale 200 million, 300 million type user product. So what's, like the, what's the growth strategy? I understand that you have the product market fit. What does it take these days when you find that fit to actually find people and have them use the service? Yeah, it's a great question. So the core value proposition of what I described, this, this page that starts as a starting point, that's not enough. What would happen, and I think LinkedIn saw this as well, is people will set up those pages. Those pages actually might live and create value for you, even if you don't engage with the product. So somebody, you, you know, if you set up your about.me page, you don't go back to it, he might visit it and you learn about me. So it's creating value for me, right? But the real trick is how do you get me to become back to the product and to be engaged? And what we did was we started to identify those people that are interested in me. Right, so it's a way for me to discover um, uh, people that are viewing my profile, people that are complimenting my profile. Uh, we um, launched a great product called Collections, people adding me to certain kind of lists if you want. And all of these things are what are driving people back into the product because guess what? We're all curious to those who are curious about us, right? It's a, it's a really basic concept. Who's not interested to know who's interested in you? Of course we all are, right? So people log back in. The trick now, and what we launched, actually we launched this morning, um, um, about five minutes ago, um, is a product called Replies. And for me, this is where we close the loop on the product. This is a huge, uh, huge piece for us. So you have your page, um, you have reasons to go back and, and see who's interacting with you, but now we're enabling people to reply and to actually forge connections. So if you complimented me, you said, hey, I, I really, awesome bio. What I'm now empowered to do is say, hey, Om, I'd love to connect. How about we grab coffee, right? Um, and here's my number, and here's my, here's my Skype, or here's my email, whatever it is. Making it frictionless for us to connect. And that's a huge idea. I want everybody to kind of pause and think about that, right? Where else can you forge connections with people that you don't know? or you kind of know but don't know that well. It is a huge, huge product for us, and we saw our users doing that already. So that's the key to our growth strategy. More people do that, more value they get, the more they'll log in, the more they'll tweet, the more they'll link to it from Twitter, from their email, whatnot. So just to be very clear, those, that's an interesting idea, 
what will you do to m make sure that it doesn't become like the LinkedIn inbox, which was essentially invitations from really random people I'd never heard before and huh. got killed because of that. That's why I actually got off LinkedIn is because it became pretty useless for me. Yeah, let's not hate on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. I'm no, 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 really I'm not clear. hating on LinkedIn. I'm just saying <laughs> at some point it becomes like a big issue when you have so much incoming. So, what so that's, not, that's not the way replies works. That's not the way about.me works. So what has to happen is you have to have complimented me. Okay. Right? So now it's in my control if I actually want right. to engage with you. You can't actually ask me to coffee. Right, that's not part of the product at this stage. I can envision a day where that, we might enable our users to add that to their page, requests or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not where we are today. So we're very sensitive about not overloading our users with a bunch of demands on them that they don't necessarily want. Right. That's the first thing. Second thing is we make sure that um, ours are notional replies. So they're gesture, gestures. It's like, um, it's like communicating through icons or stickers or something like that. So it doesn't put a burden on me to write something if I want to compliment you. It doesn't put, you, it doesn't put a burden on you to read something that's free form, right? You just recognize it, make a quick decision. That person looks interesting. I'd like to connect with them for drinks. I'd like to connect with them for coffee. I'd like to talk to them on the phone. I'd like to Skype with them, whatever it is. That's what we're going to do. Do you have a mobile application? We do. And you can do all this on the mobile app too? Um, you'll be able to do, the mobile app is like one step behind, right, okay. the browser. So um, the, the, the short answer is yes, and then the longer answer in the pain is not this week. Okay. All right. I'm going to keep bugging you about that. Okay? <laughs> Om always bugs me. <laughs> yeah. So I bug everybody. Like you're not the only one. Uh, ask my mother. Um, <laughs> um, it always comes back to your mother. It's home. always about, like, you know, we are creations of our parents. So um, let's talk about startups. I know yeah. you know a thing or two about that. You've uh, been at it for, for quite a few years. You started two companies, and you've been involved with many. So tell, tell us what you think about the startup scenario today in this current climate where there's, like, tens and thousands of companies popping up essentially every year. What do you make of all this? Yeah, I think it's a challenge. I think it's a challenge for us to find um, the proverbial needles in the haystack. But I, I'd like to switch the, the challenge back to the entrepreneur and the founder. I think there's more um, complexity. Um, when I think of my life as a founder, there's more complexity um, in the nuances of how to start a company. Um, starting the company and getting money is relatively straightforward. Um, the question is, do you do it strategically and set yourself up for success? And we've seen with, you know, AngelList and um, uh, lowering the standards of the, the, the type of money that can come into companies, we've seen a lot of party round financings. And I always kind of cringe when I look at this. Um, I think it's good on one hand because it enables more founders to get their companies going. But I think in a lot of ways it might confuse motion with progress and set them up for an interim step of potential failure. Um, so I think as a founder, you have to think about what's the composition of my round? Who's the money coming from? Do I have an anchor? Do I have somebody who's going to have my back? Do I have the basis to have an informal yet formal relationship with my investors? And I can tell you, when you raise a million dollars and you got 10 people at $100,000 each, you don't have an anchor. You really don't. And you don't have anybody who's going to have your back in that key moment. Yeah. So, so I think that's, that's critical. I think the bigger challenge, and I look at this thing is, it's like, how do you get attention for what you have, right? Like, I mean, I'm on the receiving end of all the stories and emails and pitches, and even though I want to help everyone, there isn't enough time in the day to go through each pitch and each company and think about them in a rational way. And I think at some point, attention becomes the gating factor for success. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, you've been able to find a way to rise above the noise and get a lot of attention for your company and in a good way it has helped you grow the company. Do you have any strategies or tactics you want to share with you know, wannabe founders, how yeah. they can succeed? <laughs> yeah, I have, a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, I think 
you, if you're an entrepreneur and you're a founder, you're, you're, you're opting into a vocation for life. You know, you should think of it as a 35 to 45 year career and not think about it as a, as a one year silver bullet exercise. And what that means is that you start investing in relationships very early on and you develop those, you cultivate those relationships at a very deep level where it becomes natural for you and I. Think about how you and I started meeting and talking and whatnot. I didn't ask you to write an article about me. I didn't ask you to write an article about my company day one. Like, we, we, we got to know each other, right? And I think they, everybody would um, benefit by taking a step back and thinking about the long-term um, aspects of it. Um, I also think that you have to be innovative and you have to be scrappy. And so one of the, the things that we did um, was uh, very early on when we had four people, we had 26 advisors, of which Ohm was one of them. So that's six and a half advisors per, per person. And what that allowed us to do is become less dependent on GigaOhm, the media, or TechCrunch, the media, and become much more of a partner, much more dependent on the individual who would help us to broadcast and get the word out about our product. So Kevin Rose has a million followers, or Veronica Belmont, or you, or et cetera. Just by virtue of you setting up an about.me page and then broadcasting that out, uh, you know, that's rising above the noise. Mm. And I think there's all kinds of strategies out there like that. But I think the key thing is not to copy this strategy and finding your own strategy. I think a lot of the founders always read what they, they read some blog posts about strategy and just copy it. And that's not how you work. I think today I, I, I met this young founder uh, from Israel. He was in the speaker room, essentially waiting to just talk to me. And like he knew exactly the kind of companies I like. He talked to me about his company, and I already tweeted about it. It didn't take cool. me five minutes, and it was like, wow, he totally hacked the system to find <laughs> and get my attention. And I think that's what is very important for all founders to remember, is that you're fighting not the battle for money, you're fighting the battle for talent and attention. And if you don't pay attention, to those two things, you always get left behind. Companies which are succeeding are the ones which have attention and the right attention, not necessarily the media attention, but the attention of people who actually use the product. You know, Instagram is a perfect example of that. Excellent. Yeah. So, like, when you when you look at today's founders and like, you know, you looked at founders ten years ago when I met you it was literally ten years ago and you look at founders today, what is the thing you find different? They're so much more knowledgeable. It is crazy. You know, when I met um, Matt Mullenweg, who Ohm had introduced me to from WordPress, and I think he was 19 or 20 at the time, um, you know, he didn't have the benefits of being able to read a Fred Wilson blog or a Brad Feld blog or a David Hornick inputs or to be able to access through Twitter or social networks a, a connection, right? And so in a lot of ways, you know, he was, he was betting on us to be good stewards, to be good, to, to provide the kind of with the, the blueprint a little bit of like, this is what it means to be a part of Silicon Valley. Here are good investors, you avoid this, do this. You know, today, like, that's Matt Mullenweg starting a company today. Uh, dude, he doesn't, he's plugged in. He knows how to do those things right away. They're so much more knowledgeable. It's right. crazy. I think the way I see it today, they come so much more informed. I'm not so sure about the knowledge part, well, but they're much more informed about how to deal with the certain things. And it also leads to certain preconceived notions. So I think that's the key difference in my opinion. I think, you know, we have the, the clock, you know, blinking at us like, oh, so I'm getting panicky. Uh, so the last question I have for you, when you look out into the next 10 years, what is your forecast for startups and entrepreneurial activity? I think it's going to go off the, the hook. I think every, you know, when we started, you know, when, when True Ventures started, right, and when you and I got involved with True Ventures, the iPhone didn't exist. I mean, think about that, right? Every category is up for, for grabs. Education. We just invested in Open ROV, which is a underwater submarine ro robotics company. Like, who would have thought we would do that, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago? So I think every category is up for grabs. I really yeah. do. Okay. Awesome. Cool. And I think before we go, I, I wanted to actually 
would you agree with me to wish both Geraldine and Loic like really? Uh, ah, we. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, congratulations on fantastic ten years of Loweb and mm. making it the most important event in in Europe and in the world. In it's my fantastic. opinion, it's fantastic. It's a and, gift. And and more more importantly, being generous enough to invite us again and again to be part of it. So thank you, Loic and Geraldine, and hope uh, 10 more years of success to all of you. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Appreciate it. Yeah.